Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Isaiah Jackson. I'm a trustee of this illustrious institution, and we are delighted to see such a full and welcoming house here today. Uh, we also feel a little bit like undergraduates all sitting here uh, boning up for the final exam. Uh, I, too, am in that position. Uh, uh, Dr. Dabney, after he said, uh, don't make the introduction too long, uh, said to me, I thought that uh, uh, you might be interested uh, to read uh, uh, page 12, which describes my uh, work personally uh, with Wilson. And so I, I commend to you uh, uh, Roman, page 12 of the preface. I'll also pick up my notes. Uh, very impressive uh, bio, sir, and how wonderful uh, to welcome you to uh, these, uh, these halls. You've lived and lived with Wilson and known him all of your life. When uh, some of us were acquainting ourselves with to the Finland station, you were already writing your PhD, uh, uh, your dissertation from Columbia on Wilson. You know, when Louis Menon wrote his uh, article in The New Yorker in August, uh, I was jumping up and down because I thought, Edmund Wilson, yes, yes, I like him too. And then I saw there was a new book coming out, and then how pleased all of us were to see the cover story uh, in The New York Times uh, book review uh, be the review of, uh, of your upcoming book. Now, I, uh, I noticed that the reviewer, uh, while appreciating uh, so many of the good points uh, of your book, uh, also suggested that it perhaps went into too many personal details. And I have a theory about that. You know, there was a time in the 20th century when we really only wanted to know about the words on the page. But ladies and gentlemen, it's now the 21st century, uh, and we realize that the arts come from the whole person. So we thank you for introducing uh, Wilson to us as a whole person. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dabney has been in Wyoming for uh, more than 30 years, uh, uh, although uh, they let him out briefly to come to Yale, they let him out briefly to come to Princeton. Um, perhaps when you said you wanted to come to Harvard, they wouldn't let you out. Um, but uh, I, 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 I know you will understand when I say that uh, our speaker is pawing the ground. Without further ado, please welcome Louis Dabney. As somebody once said, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> now, what I do want to do is to say I feel very comfortable here having just met a gentleman and his sister who have the same last name and he the same first name as me, although hailing from Boston, the home of whatever, uh, and uh, my, me from some sort of vaguely southern uh, province of the Dabneys, and I feel much more comfortable with all of these worthies having found a relative. Uh, <laughs> And I do not feel as though I am on alien grounds. Now, I need to tell you a story which I would not otherwise tell you, but it seems so apropos. When I saw this water coming up to me, I remembered how when Edmund Wilson had shortly after he met Mary McCarthy, he had gone to Harvard to give a lecture, which was probably one of the pieces from To the Finland Station, or part of one, his first sort of major work of critical essays in his middle years. And he wrote to Mary that uh, uh, it was a rather uh, odd occasion composed of undergraduates and uh, ancient ladies wearing earphones. He was entertaining her. And then, however, I heard about this occasion from Harry Levin, who had been there with F.O. Matheson, two of the great scholars of our time, Matheson perhaps the more profoundly distinguished of the two, and they had been there to see Wilson, and he was up here doing this piece. And Harry reminded, remembered for me how Wilson had had this table over here. And what was on this table was not the water and glasses, but something else. A bottle of whiskey. And as Wilson made a point, when he felt he could not go on, he hated the platform, but needed to do this, as he always insisted, for money. Uh, when he could not go on, he would go over and take a drink. But Harry Levin said he was not aware that this part of the curtain that he was behind was transparent. <laughs> so the audience could see him going like this and then coming out without, of course, any laughs, because those were austere days, and resuming whatever he had to say. Now, I would like to resist the temptation, which will be huge before such a large and obviously educated 
audience to go on too long, so I'm going to try to discipline myself. But I want to begin with an image which was not mine, but is interesting on the cover of the book, because one sees it's a nice picture of Wilson. It's dramatic. We all chose it. But it's interesting because you see this rather distinguished-looking fellow who also looks shrewd and not as though he were the unworldly literary man, which he in fact was. But he's holding in his hands down here a deck of cards. Now, any of you which, who know anybody who knew Wilson or heard stories about him will know that he played solitaire and he did card tricks to try to impress people, often unsuccessfully. That he was an amateur magician and not a very good man with a deck. But here is a card, a deck of cards that he's shuffling. And for me, it's quite wonderful because, as you'll see, there's a very common card that shows as a face card. It ain't a king, it ain't a jack, it ain't an ace. It's the eight of hearts. And to me, that's indicative of the kind of thing that Isaiah was talking about when he spoke about literature coming from the whole man. So there will be a little bit that's bifurcated about this talk. I want to begin with the books, and then I want to give you some go over some of the major women in his life just because I know a lot about them and do not sensationalize those relationships beyond what they can take. And I know you can make your own judgments of the work, but I think we should begin there. And I want to say that Wilson, who died over 30 years ago, began his career before modern lit was taught and analyzed in the universities. As he said at one time in, I think, a piece about Christian Goss, Gauss, as I called him, Gauss, as my father and his generation at Princeton a year or two after Wilson called him. When Wilson was studying there, uh, that uh, the latest daring writers to get into the curriculum were uh, wits of the 90s, and maybe uh, Gauss had his reputation as a bohemian romantic because he had known Oscar Wilde in Paris. But there was no modern lit. Wilson came then from a different world, and he became the focal point of a broad mainstream American culture that thought that modern literature and wanted modern literature to be able to be read and appreciated by ordinary people. They were not modernists in an abstract sense, and certainly some of them, like T.S. Eliot and Faulkner, were too difficult for some of their writings to be read by ordinary people, but this was a world before the division between the brows or between elite or whatever, had established itself as part of our consciousness. Wilson was a major player in the successful effort of his generation to establish at the heart of American life an innovative literature that would equal the great cultures of Europe. And he knew that the great cultures of Europe were there. He was not a product of a narrow American studies kind of training at all. He joined a high artistic standard with an openness to all experience and a belief that literature was as much a part <coughs> of life for everyone as conversation. He thought that Proust and Joyce and Yeats and Eliot could and should be read by ordinary Americans and helped that to happen. Wilson was a very various man. Over a period of almost 50 years, he was a dedicated a literary journalist, an investigative reporter, a brilliant memoirist, and dedicated journal keeper. His biography, biographical histories to the Finland station and patriotic gore are profoundly influential with Americans today. His major literary essays, possibly less so, simply because our culture, in spite of august institutions like this one, is not quite so committed to the triumph of art as it is to politics and history and whatever the heck we're up to, as we know in our world today, whatever we think of it. So basically, <clears throat> he bridges the great gap in our society between a kind of educated, sometimes academically uh, elite, and the general reader, and he bridges the gap between the arts and, I suppose, a certain kind of patriotism, which this building allows me to say that Wilson had. He celebrated Memorial Day and the 4th of July. He even speaks once of old glory, waving it, which he doesn't really want to do, discreetly at the end of a book. Um, he identified with this country as much or almost as much as he did with the institution of literature. He would have, of course, have hated the state in which this country finds itself today. He would have hated, obviously, our 
current uh, foreign imbroglio. But Arthur Schlesinger rightly calls Wilson one of the last Americans for whom the American Revolution was still a living event. And it lived for him as an inspiration to literature and balanced his enthusiasm for the great work of other cultures. He was as interested in ordinary Americans like the people in upstate and Talcottville, New York, as he was in the Kennedy White House, about which, of course, he was glad to hear a certain amount of gossip which he set down in his journal. So, against that backdrop, a few minutes, not too many, running down some of Wilson's major work as I would see it, and then I will try to stop in case people really want to throw out an idea or two before we go on to the deck of cards. I think that, wonderful as Axel's Castle is, I think that the best parts of it, the Joyce and Proust essays, uh, are better than some of the rest, and that Wilson's early criticism must also be represented from the American pieces about his generation in the Shores of Light, which uh, was published in the early 50s and uh, really helped Wilson to be reborn for generations uh, of intellectuals like myself and my wife and others who were products of the 50s and early 60s. Um, I think that if we're thinking of his important early criticism, the third thing that must be included there is something from the triple thinkers. As Isaiah Berlin said to me, that was the book that persuaded him that Wilson was the great 20th century critic. And he said, wonderful book, marvelous book, in this rushing way. And uh, I said, not Russian, but rushing. And I said, uh, yes. And he said, uh, you know, there are a lot of good critics, but the reason that Edmund was better than the others is that the others were, he said, sweepingly, just intelligent sentences. But in everything that Wilson wrote, there was some kind of personal content. Man in his work. But not man in his work in a reductive sense, just a very complex interrelationship of some kind. So if we think that that's the first phase of Wilson's work, I want to read you several passages in which it could be said to, ha to be coming to an end, and of course it came to the end through the depression. Now I know I have this, I will not have lost it, I found it, and it's there. All right, before the depression, Wilson was totally absorbed in Proust, and then you will see what the depression and the coming of a crisis to his country did to this. Here we are, what, oh, Oh, goodness gracious, I don't want you to read it, but it's page 150. Um, here we are up on the Cape with a, with a wonderful editor named Robert Linscott, a man from Massachusetts who ended up out uh, uh, near Northampton on a farm that had a trout stream somewhere after being a major editor editing people like Faulkner and who brought Wilson to Roger Strauss's attention in 1952. And Linscott is talking about being in 1927 up on the Cape and having dinner with Wilson. And I'll just quote now from Linscott, which is quoted by me, not from me directly. As Edmund was raising the first spoon of soup to his mouth, I asked him a question about Proust, whereupon he lowered the spoon and started to talk. Now and then he would pause, lift his spoon, then under pressure of another thought, lower his spoon and continue his talk. While a servant brought in courses of fish and dessert, he was all the time raising and lowering his spoon, but never getting it to his mouth. As his guest finished the meal, Wilson appeared to be coming down to earth, and glancing over, he exclaimed, Why, Bob, she hasn't given you anything to eat. <laughs> so that's the kind of concentration that he brought to the work of the mind, a sort of total absorption that in his later life is going to be cast around on a lot of subjects like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Iroquois uh, rituals that interest him, though he doesn't believe in them, etc., etc. Now, if, you, if I could bring you another passage to that one that added, by the time Wilson closes Axel's castle, he writes a sentence which is one of his famous sentences, periodic sentences, that sum things up, chapters up, endings up, people jumping off the cliff in the Depression, people doing this, people doing that, great periodic sentences. There's a marvelous one about General Grant in Patriotic Gore that talks about how, as a young man, he had not 
believed in the Mexican War and had not even liked to see a steak that wasn't well done. He hated raw meat so much. And how he had come to power after winning the Great War and ended his life comfortably hobnobbing with the Kaiser, talking about the value of the death penalty. And there's a sweeping sense of history there, transforming people. Now here we have Proust being written about not in 1929, but in 1931. To Axel's castle, he added a famous summation of Proust as the last great historian of the heartbreak house, Shaw, capitalist, a capitalist culture, saying, the little man with the sad appealing voice, the metaphysician's mind, the Saracen's beak, the ill-fitting dress shirt, and the great eyes that seem to see all about him like the many faceted eyes of a fly, dominates the scene and plays host in the mansion where he is not long to be master. So there's history working, isn't it? History is pushing Edmund Wilson to the left. History is destroying the kind of avant-garde consensus of the 20s, which depended on various things that were a little unsound in some ways. History is moving through Wilson and his prose there as he would later observe it moving through people like Lincoln and Grant, whether or not they actually quite knew what was occurring. Now, I want to show you what it's like when he goes out to report on that history that's moving. In Chicago, in the winter of 1932, he toured, he was visiting Jane Adams at Hull House. He toured the neighborhood with a relief worker, quizzing immigrant families who grew poorer instead of assimilating into the American middle class. In the flop houses, he writes, the single men eat their chicken feed and slum amid the deafening clanging of trays and dump the slops in GI cans. They kill time in big bare chambers smothered with smoke, strewn with newspapers like vacant lots, smeared like the pavements with phlegm. 67 black families huddled without any utilities in the seven-story Angeles building, caged in a dingy mesh of fire escapes like mattress springs on a junk heap. In another neighborhood, a woman fed herself and her son by picking through garbage, first removing her glasses so she couldn't see the maggots on the meat. The teenaged boy, and this is my comment, who could see perfectly well, weighed 82 pounds. So it was in this situation that Wilson set out to write to the Finland station. The first of those books, which rightly or wrongly, Americans have taken to their heart more deeply than Wilson's great essays. Before I leave that subject, the great essays in The Wound and the Bow also stand, and I think probably might be the single best work that Wilson wrote, because Dickens, Kipping, Kipling, Hemingway, Philoctetes, which is the thesis of the wound and the bow, the relation between art and neurosis or between life and work, not a formula but a suggestion. All of this along with uh, a couple of essays less, uh, less famous than that, actually the one that corrects Hemingway in midlife that Hemingway was so angry about uh, and that he threatened to sue and so the book was not published by Scribner's. Um, the wound and the bow is a marvelous collection. But if we want to go to those central books that Americans have paid more attention to in the last 20 years, the first is to the Finland station. Now I notice that in lots of reviews in which, incidentally, my work has been somewhat excessively praised, people have gone out of their way to notice that Wilson overly worshipped Lenin into the Finland station and that he was not obviously entirely well informed about him. But to read the book is to have the following impression. You start out with a man named Michele, who is teaching Wilson about history the way that Vico taught Michele about the social sciences. And out of Michele comes Wilson's conviction that you can write about a great movement while sympathizing with it, without distorting the historical record, even though, and you can write about actions from the point of view of they're taking place right now, like what's going on in this country at the moment, even though you know how it turned out because you're looking back on it. And you can recreate these historical personalities in order to carry on the work of the human race without falsifying the record. And I will never forget how Wilson looked at me as a young man and said, you must teach yourself never to make a statement that is not based on verifiable evidence. Well, that 
probably slowed down the book for a while. <laughs> but in fact, then, he starts the book not with Lenin. It doesn't involve the Russians at all. And after we get to Karl Marx, at proceeding through the utopian socialists and uh, uh, kind of early French revolutionary stuff, Michelet was the product of the fading of the French Revolution, even though he kept it going in a way through liberté, égalité, fraternité as a historian. After you get to Karl Marx, the book blossoms. And there are 250 pages on Marx and Engels. And they're certainly the single largest portrait slash essay that Wilson ever wrote, and undoubtedly one of the finest. Because although he, by the time he came to write this, it's in the center of the book, the revolution in Russia had already faded for him. So if we look ahead to the end for the moment, we find Lenin being too much idealized as a young man, Trotsky being in a certain sense sympathized with because perhaps he was writer than Lenin than we knew at the time. The revolution has happened. We have won the great historical battle, but what's standing behind the door at the Finland station is Stalin. So it's not going to work for obvious reasons, whether or not he could figure out Lenin at that time, which he couldn't. But what he does is he goes back to Marx, and that disillusionment sharpens his vision of the creator so that Marx then becomes the center of the book. And in a way, he is his own creation. And he is, which is why I wanted to mention this just before I got to it, Marx becomes kind of the wounded artist, creator, thinker, scientist, who somehow helps humanity to move ahead a little bit, but it's two steps forward, one step back. And we understand this through the Marx portrait, which is, uh, I think, absolutely magnificent. I'm not entirely sure that there are not places in it where someone could argue that it's exaggerated a little. He takes a lot of Marx's enthusiasm for ideas and his moral intensity. Wilson chooses dramatically to refer to Marx's Jewish origin combined with his relationship to certain of the ideas of the 18th century and the romanticism which connected a figure like Marx with the Beethoven that we remember from old records. Uh, it may be that Wilson paints with a very broad brush, but he captures something absolutely essential in Marx and Marxism. Again, Manand, who's a very, very bright man, will say things like, you know, Wilson couldn't understand the dialectic whatsoever. That's true. He decided in an empirical American-British tradition that the dialectic was a kind of magical, you know, mumbo-jumbo. Now, clearly there is something to that, but clearly that's not the whole affair. But the important thing that Wilson does in his Marx chapters is he tries to understand why Marx's personal life was painful and what this has to do with the work, and what it has to do with Marx's insights. So we don't just have images of Marx crawling around on the floor with his children, or going to have wonderful picnics in the park. We have images of a perfectly terrible life that the Marx and his family are leading. But it isn't just something that Wilson could sentimentalize, as in an opera, poor Marx and his garret with a revolutionary idea because Wilson notices very carefully how exploitative Marx is in Wilson's view of Engels. Now, there are persons who could turn around and have written good books to prove that Frederick Engels was terribly important. Wilson thought he was the human being, the warm-hearted, liberal, man with his feet in the, in the real world of people who Marx needed to set off his abstract insight. But he also shows you how Marx sort of used up Engels. And it had to do with Marx's high-mindedness. After all, can you write for money if you're a writer? Marx would say the writer does not write for money. He writes for the sake of writing. So then who has to write for money? Engels. And of course, he has to keep up his father's business, his, the whole business which he doesn't like. And he writes endless articles for the New York Herald Tribune, which are published over Marx's name because Marx has the great reputation, and Marx sort of nags him occasionally, you know, have you got that piece done yet? And Wilson then really turns against him when Marx doesn't go to the funeral of Engels' mistress Jenny. Now, that might have hit Wilson, since, as you will soon see, he had a mistress, 
at one time, but it's a lot more involved than that. He just, Marx is trying to apologize to Engels, and he can't say anything except, sometimes I think I could be blind or go mad. He's sort of solipsistic. So what Wilson does is he thinks there's a lot of, to use a cliche way of putting it, a lot of negativity and misery and unhappiness is going into this project. Well, is it merely that it costs great things to move humanity ahead, if humanity moves ahead at all? And the answer is no. Marx is internalizing the exploitative relations of the industrial age. He is, in his own life, part of the process, and this, which costs him a lot and results in a lot of unhappiness in a sadomasochistic prose that I have read translations of Dutch Das Kapital, which just wither you, the constitution was brought into the world by the bayonets of the bourgeoisie, but in the womb it was bayoneted before it could get out. You know, all of this kind of stuff. Wilson sees this as a kind of inner register of what Marx is going through, but also as the mark of how Marx could understand his age. He can understand the trauma of mankind under early industrial capitalism by in some way participating in it, internalizing it, enacting it. Now, I once thought this might be Edmund Wilson fondly pulling off a magic trick. That is to say, not totally convincing, but I've really thought it through and I think he's right. And as he says in that business, great books come out of the experiences that are out of depth. Uh, what makes a book is not just the breadth of information, but the depth from which it has been drawn. And in this Marx portrait, as in Wilson's own great literary essays and certain other great portraits, like the portrait of, say, Grant and Justice Holmes in Patriotic Gore, Wilson understands the figure because of something in him. Now, it isn't solipsism. He doesn't understand Karl Marx just because he, Wilson, sometimes felt a little Promethean, like Marx did all the time. I'm throwing rocks at God. He didn't understand Marx just because Marx had a miserable personal life, but he was Wilson, and by this time he'd had three lousy, two lousy marriages and was on his third. He never had any money, like Marx. He had to get it away from his mother, who doled out the money that father had left for her to manage them because his mother was very competent. But it was, as someone who knew these relationships in old New York once said to me, the silver umbilical cord. So there was a lot that Wilson could be angry through, and he used it to understand Marx, as Marx, he think, used his to understand the age that he was shaping and trying to fight against. So this is the level on which Wilson, in the Marx portrait and in the great literary essays and in patriotic gore, is profound, not simply clever. I'm really convinced of that. Now, what I want to do, if I can find this in these notes, and I believe I might be able to, if I have it, if I don't, I will survive. Um, what I want to do is briefly to fast forward in a rather kaleidoscopic way, skipping over World War II and the end which it brought about of Wilson's podium at the Old New Republic when the magazine was taken over on behalf of the British cause of its owners over the death of Scott Fitzgerald and Wilson's wartime isolation on the Cape, when he went back into the past, beginning his affirming memoirs and his largely grim fiction as memoirs of Hecate County, to skip over the bitter later years with McCarthy, which I'll come back to, romantic forays with other women, the one with Anais Nin is the funniest, uh, and his marital fulfillment at last with Elena Mumthornton, his years starting over again as a New Yorker reviewer. For the second time within 30 years, he's beginning by doing hundreds of reviews, establishing himself that way before he can write lar larger articles and become uh, the a sort of exploring big subjects. I want to skip over even the creation of the Shores of Light, a compendium of youthful writing that helped to anchor Wilson's reputation in his later years, and the gratifying moment when Nabokov took the place of Fitzgerald and Dos Passos as his closest friend, a kind of uh, semi-discipleship for a while until, of course, Lolita, which was the real beginning of their separation, Wilson supplied to him a text 
from Havelock Ellis that Nabokov used to create Lolita, but he really didn't like it. And he couldn't be dishonest enough to hide this, and he didn't like it because, as he said to Nabokov in a letter, you know, um, nasty uh, relationships made good books, but I don't think you've quite got away with it. Uh, in fact, he says, it's, a, uh, it's too long, and he makes up objections to the form, and he says the moral business at the end isn't very convincing. But he really just didn't like it. And the reason was, if you go back to Proust and Joyce, you think that once upon a time, what we now call modernism, Edmund would not have liked it to be called modernism, too abstract for him, but what we call modernism was a high enterprise. Proust had a sick personal life, but that didn't keep him from making a great statement about the role of art in transcending this world, right? through the Madeleine, through the whole business of memory, through the past retrieved, through the thoughts on the death of Bergot that speak of all of us following obligations that seem to reach us as if from another world. Proust was a high figure. Joyce was a high figure. He might have dealt with sensuality that was rough on the Victorians, but he was a, a firmer of the human family, etc., etc. Nabokov wasn't. Wilson couldn't stand it. He didn't say that, but that made the break in their relationship that the quarrel over translating Pushkin later consolidated. Meanwhile, in Wilson's late years, he has the wonderful friendship of W.H. Auden, who had been not being in the same field at all as Wilson and being a poet, Wilson could simply look up to as a great poet. And Auden once said to Wilson, I write for you alone, you know. Well, now that, of course, is an attempt to make an old man feel better, but there was a little bit to it. So anyway, I skip over all of this, and I come to a brief excursus into, if I can find out where I am here, I think I am, into uh, patriotic gore. And I want to say that here is a book that is quite different in its premises than To the Finland Station. There is no dominant figure like Marx or decisive event toward which the book moves, like Lenin's arrival in Petrograd by train in 1917. On one level, Wilson might seem to have turned conservative, but in fact, in fact, uh, Patriotic Gore is essentially a skeptical book. It's an old man's book in the sense that someone has lived for a while and he knows that things turn out, didn't turn out the way we thought they would. And he knows how people's relationships and roles in history and in their own lives have changed uh, at any rate in the 19th century. And we would assume today, if our society has enough stability and force and order for anyone to recognize how changes are actually occurring. But I want to say that in patriotic gore, skepticism overcomes myth. It was doing so in To the Finland Station, but Wilson almost muffles that because he's got to get out of his radical period alive and with the great portrait of Marx. And then he releases his skepticism freely 20 years later in Patriotic Gore. And here we, we see how different are the roles and uh, values of commanding personalities. For example, Lincoln, who starts out as a free thinker, acquires a Hebraic piety about God's will. Remember all those wonderful statements about how we're all going to suffer till it's his, his pleasure. He really becomes Old Testament. Partly, however, Wilson thinks because he, Lincoln, is caught up in creating a myth to justify all the suffering that is being caused in the war. And that myth Wilson respects in Lincoln. He does not respect it in what it's going, he thinks, to do to our culture. And I don't wish to be overly political about the present scene in uh, uh, our uh, nation's politics, but I think that Wilson, if he were here, would turn to you gentlemen and say, do you guys think it's a coincidence that the ship on which the words mission accomplished were blazoned forth was the USS Abraham Lincoln? That doesn't mean Lincoln would have wanted that. But it does mean that Lincoln's life and death, as Wilson saw them, even though he's deeply involved with Lincoln, who was his father's hero, as his father became Edmund's, in some sense 
Lincoln was the person whose life and death gave great strength to what Wilson sees as a kind of American myth that our wars are moral wars. We get in wars to do good. I mean, you know, the French and the Germans might have fought each other because they hated each other. Unfortunate facts, but on the other hand, at least they weren't, from Wilson's point of view, letting out a lot of uh, moral, and I won't use a four-letter word, which is designed partly to persuade themselves about the value of what they're doing. So then there is that aspect of the book. But the thing that's interesting here is the skepticism involved in that rules the book and not a kind of dogma related to trying to attack wars or America. Or, and it not, it's not ideologically on the conservative side as an answer to, to the Finland station. What rules the book is pluralism. Because when Wilson gives up his belief in a central uh, kind of force in history, which you can follow, what comes out is a bunch of individuals. And you understand them, and they're all involved in each other's stories, and they all take different roles in each other's stories. There's an absolutely wonderful moment in the portrait of Justice Grant, I mean of, of General Grant, where we see, uh, who is the other Adams? Brooks Adams, I think, talking brilliantly about Grant as a commander, and Henry Adams then talking about him as Adams does in the education, where he says, and I believe I quote this accurately, the progress of evolution from President Washington to President Grant was alone evidence to upset Darwin. <laughs> so then Wilson sees all this different stuff going on, and people look at each other, and in the long run what comes out of it is humanistic, although there is this background of a sort of dark patriotic view. And I would say that the great portraits there are uh, <clears throat> Lincoln, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Grant, Sherman, who is absolutely brilliantly portrayed by Wilson. Uh, he was a man who rather liked Southerners, didn't much disapprove of slavery. But when you give him that command, he knows how to make Georgia howl as though he was the Lord's instrument. That's his job, and God knows he can do it. And after the war, he sort of restores his balance. And while Grant is more or less taken over politically, we all know what General Sherman said, don't we, when he was asked to run for president? Because we know it because all our politicians who pretend that they're not interested just want us to inter be interested in them. General Sherman said, I will not run if nominated and shall not serve if elected. <laughs> so he knew what he was doing. And in his later years, he's an attractive figure, a diner out, a lover of Shakespeare and Dickens. The man who made Georgia Howell is seen when his wife is dying on the second floor of their house, running up into her bedroom and saying, Ellen, wait for me, I want to come with you. And, of course, when he dies three years later in front of the fire, he's rereading Great Expectations. So this is what Wilson does in his later years. He sees how complex it all is. Now... Uh, against that kind of backdrop, I wish to turn immediately to what I would have to call a very rapid survey of some of the people involved in Wilson's Eight of Hearts. And he had many, many friends whom he knew. I'm skipping over the literary personalities, Fitzgerald, Despassos, Auden, Nabokov, and all the others. There are women among them, Louise Bogan, whom he loved and to whom he was a sort of sister for him in the 30s when Wilson was between marriages and he a literary brother to her. Uh, the uh, uh, wonderful writer, um, what is her name? Uh, it'll come back to me. Uh, whom he knew at the Cape. I'll have to look at my pictures. Uh, I'll find my pictures here, and that will, that will take me right to it. Yes, indeed. Um, yes, Mary Meggs uh, and uh, Mary Claire Blaye, uh, who's a, become, a, become a marvelous, world-class novelist, and Barbara Deming, who went on to lead the march at Seneca. Well, uh, Barbara and Mary were Wilson's sort of stable on the Cape in the long winters when there wasn't much company, and they used to get together and play cards and things like this, and he decided he was in love with Mary, and his fourth wife, Elena Thornton, thought this was interesting because Mary was known to be a lesbian. And Elena said, uh, let us see who will do what with whom. 
And of course, what happened was that Mary Meggs ran away with Mary Claire Blaye, living Barbara Deming brokenhearted and Wilson deeply distressed after he had introduced this third factor into their nice little literary community. But to start back at the beginning, I think I ought to touch on the five or six women who mattered most to, to Malay, to Wilson. And first I'll take Malay, who was supposed to be the one most, uh, he was most attached to, Edna. And in fact, um, this was not the woman most important to Wilson, as her biographers like to say. But she was someone who initiated him and broke his heart. And those are useful things, if they happen at the right time, uh, perhaps. Uh, his friend John Peel Bishop, who was less vigorous than Wilson and more thin-skinned, never recovered. Wilson recovered to be a kind of staff of Malay in later life when she was out of fashion and her personal life had become extremely uh, neurotic, alcoholic, druggy, whatever. And Wilson continued to support and believe in her as he did after her death. He writes of her in several beautiful uh, brief statements uh, in poetry, he writes of her in an unsuccessful characterization in his youthful novel, I Thought of Daisy. He writes of her as he went to see her having married Elena in 1948 when she was at the end of her life and seemed adrift. And it's a heartbreaking passage in the journals called The Forties, which is recapitulated and expanded in his famous memoir of Malay after her death in 1952. So it becomes part of literary history because Wilson experienced it. But it didn't break his own heart for very long, maybe for a year or so. And it's quite witty when you read about this in the journals because Malay, although heartless and I think not particularly likable in her relationship to these young men, she complained that their all being in love with her didn't even seem to make them fight each other. Um, but there's a one, there are wonderful scenes, like the scene where Wilson has stolen a kiss from Malay behind a bush on the Cape, and he says in his journal, he remembers saying, and he always tells the truth about himself and never makes himself look better. He may get things wrong, but not in, to his own advantage. And he says, I said to her that by the time we're 50, we'll be two of the most interesting people in the United States. And you know what this apostle of spontaneous youth said? She said, you behave as if you were 50 already. <laughs> so Wilson, of course, manages to let us know that he was pretty wise, but he also gets the laugh on himself in that kind of situation. Now, I wish to turn briefly to his first wife, Mary Blair, because nothing is known at all about her. I had to kind of bring her up from many shreds and patches and little scraps and memories. She was called the O'Neill actress when they married. Um, they married because Mary Blair was pregnant. Uh, and uh, I think Wilson had been sort of ambivalent about the whole affair. And Mary Blair certainly was because she loved her career. And she had arranged for there to be an abortion. And they decided not to have one. And they decided to go on together and make a life as comrades in arms on the margins of the bourgeois world and have their child. And it was a disaster. And uh, it was a disaster all around. Mary Blair was not interested in domestic life. Uh, Edmund was reasonably ineffectual at that. His mother supplied a nurse. But it ended up being old Mrs. Wilson down in Red Bank, New Jersey, who, when this, this marriage began to break up, took Rosalind down there. Mary Blair went on the road trying to save her career. She was the O'Neill actress, but she wasn't steady and she wasn't glamorous, and she wasn't going to make it in the world that O'Neill made on Broadway. And uh, meanwhile, Rosalind was being brought up by Mrs. Wilson, who was very good to her and whom she loved, but who never did her the favor of telling her that her mother had tried to take care of her for the first three years of her life. So well, Rosalind grew up feeling somewhat rejected, except by a very Victorian, dogged, and in some ways unpleasant grandmother, who was good to her, and expected too much from her father, who was a bohemian. She liked being with him. She didn't like being with her mother's people. She was sure that, Edmund, that her father would always be there. But she has many things in her memoirs about how lost and let down she is 
As a little girl, she has too many personalities trying to please too many people. In her later life, she's very bitter at all the women Edmund Wilson, naturally, being the married kind or the kind to have an affair, preferred to her. So it was not a happy situation. Mary Blair went on to become an O'Neill character. And if I had felt cheap and sensational, I could have called my chapter about her Mary Blair's Long Day's Journey into Night. She became a drunk, she had, in, she had uh, TB, uh, and she spent her last years berating the man whom everyone had thought was too weak to stay with her, who had stayed with her when her life crashed, who had himself lost his position as vice president of Frigidaire because he drank. And it was a very unpleasant scene. The only person who was loyal to her was Wilson, who was not a very good person to be basically married to, but if you had been his lover or his wife and became his friend, he would do anything for you. And that was generally the way his life went. Now, the third person I have to speak about, because I had great difficulty trying to do justice to her, is the taxi dancer, as she was once called, and waitress, Frances Minahan, who would be familiar to those of you who have read it as the Anna of uh, memoirs of Hecate County's The Princess with the Golden Hair. The person whom Wilson gets liberated with at last, when he is 30, she whiz, 32, and really loves sex and loves this woman and loves her hardy low life and her tales of it and her strength of character. But, of course, there being many things between them, a class difference is too crude a way to put it, they were never, she never thought he ought to marry her, and Edmund really never took this very seriously. And so it took him a long time to figure out that Francis really loved him. He would say, she took, had me take her in my arms and held me as though for me to hold her brought her some measure of, of relief. So Wilson then is slow on the uptake in relation to persons. But he loved Francis genuinely, and I hated the view that was taken of Francis by my predecessor, uh, Jeffrey Myers, who dug up some interesting things, but whose attitude toward such matters as this is of what he considers to be a randy masculine attitude. That is to say, of course he loved Francis. He could screw and no complications. But that wasn't the story at all. It was difficult for them both. And Wilson was loyal to her. He gave her the same operation that the guy has uh, given to Anna, which Wilson paid for, a kind of hysterectomy in Memoirs of Hecate County, and he stepped back so that she could go her own way. Now, what really complicates all this and makes Wilson's work much more dramatic than the novel he couldn't write, his prime means his, makes his life much more dramatic than the novel he couldn't write, is that, of course, the woman he became closest to in later life, after her death, Margaret Canby was the person he decided to marry when he didn't know what to do about his relationship with Francis. So he married Margaret, who wanted to do something with her life. She was a genteel, refined, rather upper-class woman from Santa Barbara, whom Wilson met through his roustabout, uh, I don't know quite how to describe Ted Paramore, whose name really was Paramore, not quite spelled the same way, uh, a Yaley who drank and didn't have to do anything uh, and had not been able to propose to uh, Margaret Canby when they were young. So she married another man, uh, James Canby, uh, and they had a son, Jimmy, and I believe that one of their daughters is in the audience tonight uh, and look forward to meeting her. But in the meantime, of course, what was terribly wrong about all of this was that although Wilson loved to be with Margaret and he loved her as a drinking companion, he did not fall in love with her until, guess what? She died. Two years into their marriage, she died. They had been separated by her need to live on the coast in California for some months of the year so that she could be with her son who was attending school there. And when they were together, he was totally dedicated now to bringing about a radical social change in the United States. And Margaret felt that he didn't need her. And in addition to the writer's capacity to use up someone who's just sitting around while he's writing, he's using her up because she's part of the society 
that at that time were slipping into the past, like the sentence about Proust. So poor Margaret is there with Wilson, and it's the depressing winter of 1931 to 32 in New York, and she's talking about suicide, and he's drinking, and they're quarreling, and by June she goes home to California, and they sort of get it together when they're apart, and they're talking about her coming back to, the, to live with him in the fall, and she is outside on a rain-swept or fog-swept outside stone terrace, outside a fancy house in Santa Barbara wearing spiked heels. She, like Wilson's mother, was only five feet tall, and she fell down the stairs and broke her neck. So from that moment dates, I would suppose, the second of Wilson's great loves, which was for Margaret. The first was for Francis, which he never expressed. The second was for Margaret, which he expressed uh, very romantically after she was dead. And he has an absolutely savage account of himself and their life and the funeral and all the things that he can remember that he's been cruel to her in and all his neglect of her that was incorporated by Leon Adele in the journal called The Thirties. And the culminating statement, it's got wonderful things in it and it shows you that Margaret was herself a deeply poetic soul. She said when she was taken in and placed upon the bed, almost like Wilson was feeling he was Othello, sleepy, when asked how she felt, getting ready for the big sleep. And Wilson says of himself, of Margaret, in this passage written within a couple of years after her death, after she was dead, I loved her. But he also remembers how she says that he, I, I wish I could think of that marvelous, uh, absolutely horrendous phrase that she uses for him, which he incorporates in the journal, and I guess you'll just have to read my chapter to see what it was, because he really does understand that he is in some profound way weak. And one of the things Wilson says about his life is the judgment that I was said to have in a few literary and historical pieces was paid for by an incompetence in life which could never suit the means to the end. And the big thing that this was long before Margaret's death, but the big thing that proved this to him was that Margaret died. So here is Wilson, he's adrift, and what does he begin to do? This is the end of Margaret. He starts dreaming of her, and he writes down his dreams. He always writes down his dreams, and in these dreams it's a kind of Orpheus-like scene. He's always dreaming that he's about to get Margaret back. But of course, he wakes up. And that goes on in his dreams. The last recorded one is in 1961. Now, it may be that some of you will want to talk about the Mary McCarthy scene, so I will touch on it very briefly, although I, needless to say, had to do more work with this and be more careful of this and think it through further than anything else in the book biographically because this was well known to be a very unpleasant relationship at its end with fault on both sides and I wished to approach the whole thing fairly. I was skeptical of some of Mary's claims to her first biographers that Wilson beat her. And the reason I was skeptical of these is that Rosalind, who was the only living witness who was supposed to have witnessed these things in her book, which was available to the same early McCarthy biographers, denied it. Now, Mar Rosalind was a little hipped on her father, but I realized that she also was, she hated him in some ways for not making it all up to her, but I realized from some of Mary's friends that Mary McCarthy had some difficulty Though she loved to picture herself as a truth teller, she had some difficulty telling the truth at any rate where her own self was concerned. She was a satirical artist and an exaggerator. And when I spoke with a woman named Adelaide Walker, now dead, who was Mary's best friend and neighbor on the Cape for many years, and who knew what she knew about and said, did Mary beat her? Well, Adelaide said the same thing she later said to the biographer Francis Kiernan, who got some of these facts a little clearer, well, Mary, I never saw it or saw evidence of it, but Mary felt beaten anyway. Well, why did she feel beaten? If there are any in this room who have read that marvelous memoir, Memoirs of a Catholic Girl, you know why she felt beaten. 
because she was beaten as a child. She was in this society of people who talk all the time, pretend to be victimized. She was a real victim. She and her brothers were beaten on principle by the courtesy and aunt and uncle to whom they were boarded out by her grandparents after their parents both died of influenza. And Mary suffered a severe trauma, which she never acknowledged until she went to write Memoirs of a Catholic Girlhood. In her adult life, she did not. She had a long analysis with three different therapists when she was with Wilson. Guess what its subject was? But she also resented Wilson by that time, and she wanted to get out of their relationship, and she viewed the analysts as his friends, three stooges, who would help Wilson to somehow prevail and adjust her to their marriage. So she could never be entirely direct about the trauma that she suffered as a child. And she hid this from Wilson. And of course he hid from her, not his drinking, but let's say the extent of it and the fact that he could fly into temper tantrums. And Mary, to her biographers, and to me most of the time, gave forth the following line, which she herself later referred to as the authorized version, but that was Wilson's authorized version. The authorized version was that she had never had any problems until Wilson beat her up. And because he beat her up, she would later, as she told her friend Elizabeth Hardwick, uh, who's confided in me more than once and who adored Mary, she but thought her sense of truth and morality a little strange at times, she would go out and he would beat her up and retreat into his study. And that was why she went out more than once and set a fire with papers against his study wall and tried to burn the place down because he had beaten her up. Well, as long as you think he really beat her up, then you think there was madness here. But the moment you know that he did not, but that she felt beaten anyway, you know that she was wrestling with her demons and unable to acknowledge this because Wilson was an oppressive figure. But he was an oppressive figure because he had the talent, the brains, the classical training, the heavy masculine strength, and the position in the literary world, which had made her fall violently in love with him uh, in a very superficial way out of the head and throw herself at him. And Wilson had thought, oh, how wonderful, this brilliant young woman. I'll get what I never got with Edna heart and head conjoined, and my daughter Rosalind will get a wonderful stepmother, which of course didn't happen either. Things don't turn out that way. Rosalind and Mary never really got along. So here I was with a dilemma, and I didn't know how I was going to write my chapters on Wilson and McCarthy. And Mary herself, who was very good to me, which is why I tried hard to be fair to her, she had me and my wife, who was back here, uh, to visit her at Castine, Maine, for four days in which she talked to me constantly. And at the end of the evening, we would go down and basically sit with Elizabeth Hardwick, and she would say, what did she say today? Uh, <laughs> but Mary said to me, I said, Mary, here's what Wilson says about you in the trial records. You know, it was all sorts of unpleasant things. They had to accuse each other of things to try to get custody. And uh, he says that you uh, basically had these temper tantrums and these screaming fits and that they had nothing to do with your fights. And she said, well, now you know that's true. I had those things in my youth, went into my first marriage, don't have them now. And then she said, of course, when I began my conversations with Mary McCarthy, she said, you may not have a tape recorder, and if you say anything I don't really like or like, don't like the way you've used it, I'll deny you said it. But she said, now you may say that if you want, as long as you don't say it in anything that's published while I'm alive. So the point is Mary McCarthy herself generously gave me the key. Why did she give me the key? We could talk about that in the question period, but we need to go on. I have my theories. After McCarthy came Elena. But before I leave this, I want to say that what was nice about Wilson and McCarthy was that they became friends later over the upbringing of their son, Rule, who has always, in some sense, been restive in relation to his father and in some sense identified with his mother, but they shared their concerns as parents. It brought them together, and Mary was terribly loyal to Wilson as he got weak in his last years, 
get, got him a prize with some help from Jimmy Baldwin, got him a prize from a French literary group worth, as she wrote to her ailing ex, $5,545. And she said, what was most wonderful was that the Portuguese writer who finally voted for you to have the prize thought he was voting for Angus Wilson and was slightly deaf. So Mary was then a very loyal ex-husband until... When Wilson had been 10 years dead, Leon Adele, who edited the journals at points imperfectly, but in this matter was without fault, sent Mary some, a page and a half that Wilson had written to explain why he had dropped his journal for the better part of seven years, writing just about four pages in the whole darn time, when he used to write it all the time. And he had to say something, and he just said, our life was positively nightmarish. Mary's collapses were tragic, and having to cover them up, was impossible for us both. And I was a little neurotic, you know, the way we men know we are, a little neurotic. But Mary was rather childlike and dependent, and you could never do much for her. And uh, Mary McCarthy was so furious at this page and a half, which she thought Wilson had yielded to his bad self and left behind after his death as a bomb to blow her up, that she spent the rest of her life attributing to him all of the vices she had attributed to the people in her fiction, only partly modeled on Wilson, and going on with the tale of his brutality. But I believe that because Mary was generous to me, I was able to rescue Wilson without traducing her, and I believe as I ended that uh, piece, if I can find what I said there at the end, uh, I believe that the best things about Mary were written by her work, by uh, Carol Brightman, who did not, I think, handle the life with Wilson well, and by her life, by Francis Kiernan, who laid out all the evidence on the table that what everybody saw or said about Mary and kind of allows you to take your own, your own pick at putting it together. But I believe that I have done the best job about the couple, and what I say to conclude my chapter is American Letters has not seen another alliance so flawed and so distinguished. So, to conclude very briefly with a person who's much longer than the time we can actually take with her, Elena Mum Thornton, who saved Wilson's life and saved his family life insofar as a woman could, which was pretty far, was an aristocrat of mixed Russian and German background who found in the man of letters a cause and object of care. Their marriage began very romantically. It survived his drinking and his temper. He loved her deeply, both sexually as, and as a helpmeet. The cosmopolitan European woman and the American male with his national traits of pragmatism and self-dependence and his crusty qualities complemented each other, where Mary and he were potential competitors on the same turf. It was a modern-day Jamesian alliance. Elena returned his love in full measure as her Paris cousin Marina Shuvalov wrote to me one day on the beach at Wellfleet. Elena, who hadn't had an easy day for reasons having nothing to do with Edmund, had had her swim in the ocean and was reading a New Yorker article of his. She got up and brushing off the sand, said to Marina with a smile, when I read his work, I forgive him all his sins. She was unable to do much for Rosalind, but Rua loved her as a boy and young man. And uh, Elena's daughter, Helen, who grew up identifying herself as her mother's child, had sufficient solidity in that maternal relationship to be able, in her, as she grew older, to accept her role as Edmund Wilson's daughter and to have a very uh, positive, though realistic, view of her father. I don't know if any of you happened to hear the interview that I made in August of, over WBUR on the program On Point, but do you remember that Helen came in at the end? And after saying nice things uh, to me, she said to me, well, what about my mother's relations with women? And she went on to say what Elena said to she was She said in introducing herself, well, as a young woman, I was a feminist the way the Chinese were Chinese communists. You know. And then she said, I was saying to my mother one day something about my father and women, and she raised an eyebrow, and Helen said, I think you remember on that program, my mother didn't fool around with me. And she said, I don't think that's true, Helen. And she said, I've been thinking about it, and now more and more of my women friends are telling me how much women did for, Wilson did for women artists and writers. And in fact, I know this because it's a 
book that Helen would like me to try to write at this point, and at this point I don't think I can write it, because I think, not that it isn't true, but I think it would sound like I was trying to rationalize his sexual behavior too much. But I think that uh, Wilson uh, was very, very fortunate in Elena, and you should know that they're buried down there on the Cape, and each has a stone, and his has the Hebrew hazak, hazak, vanit, hazaik, which I mispronounce, of course, which means begin reading each book of the Torah all over again, tells the Orthodox Jew that he can never stop what he's doing, but to Wilson meant be strong, to yourself, true to yourself as a writer, don't give way, and Elena has Greek on her tombstone that refers to the immortal soul. And there they are, and uh, Edmund Wilson was lucky, and the end of his life was not pleasant, as you know if you read my book. It was difficult in his last four years to fall apart and record every minute of it. But uh, there he is. Now, the last thing I would say before opening myself to as many questions as you can have, but there has to be an instrument here which drags me off stage. What did we call that in the old vaudeville routine? The hook! That's right, <laughs> the hook. But what I would like to say is, in putting this together, I have two thoughts to leave you with, two perspectives. The first is that of Isaiah Berlin, who was very good to me and gave me an interview that helped me, as McCarthy did, gave me the truth. Berlin gave me the larger picture. And he thought that Wilson really was a little uncomfortable in life, that he was living kind of vicariously through books, and that his sense of having to tell the truth about books was mixed up with the fact that he was somehow uncomfortable within the living world. And as Sir Isaiah said, he kept uh, sort of rubbing on something inside himself, and that caused the friction, and the friction caused the genius. So for Berlin, then, it's a modified version of the wound and the bow. Now, I never bought that because Wilson was such a vital figure. He loved so many people, and not simply women. He did so many things well. You could never read his writing about the Indians, about the Jews, about... Jerusalem the Golden, where faiths fester to destroy the world and a certain high idealism survives it. You can never read this stuff carefully without feeling just the way Elena did. And it was all vitality. Now, you spoke about Mr. Toybin, who wrote about me, and some people thought it was insufficiently kind. I thought it was extremely kind. And I loved what he said toward the end of his piece. He said, it is too easy to suggest that Wilson the lover and the boozer should be kept away from Wilson the writer. His private life did not make its way into his best work, which was his criticism, in a way that it did in the case of novelists like his friend Scott Fitzgerald or indeed Saul Bellow. Uh, Torben thinks that Wilson's a sort of Saul Bellow kind of character. And yet Wilson's personality, his sensuous nature, entered his writing in a way that is rare for critics and historians. And we think again of that picture. The wreck of his first two marriages, I'll go on with this, the bitterness of his third, the happiness he found in his last two decades, and the sheer quantity of his drinking reflect both comically and intensely on his state of mind. His passion for ideas, for making judgments, for writing elegantly, for telling a story with pace, and for learning languages is the same reckless passion he felt for many women, for staying up all night drinking or taking long taxi rides without a care for the cost. A wonderful man named David Shavjavadze, who grew up on the Cape, told me how as a young man he had written a printed, typed-out newspaper called the Truro Tattler, and in the Truro Tattler, he observed one day, Edmund Wilson was seen passing through a car, through town in a, car, in a taxi with Washington, D.C. plates. <laughs> he loved life as much as he loved letters. He loved his learning as much as he loved mankind. And I think that uh, uh, never have I seen, despite Mr. Toybin's worries about whether there's too much sex, which I thought perhaps were intended to make people buy the book. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think I've seen that kind of attention that this book has received from him and from other writers, as in the wonderful piece in the September Harpers and the wonderful piece in the next to current New Republic, which is about, that's about the work and the piece 
in Harper's is about me and the biography, I think that I've been extraordinarily fortunate, and it's all Wilson, because the culture really needs him. And I think people feel that need. Maybe they feel it partly because we have so many good journalists who aren't quite Wilson. Maybe they feel that need partly because he's the last of the great writers of the 20th century to have found his place because he wasn't a novelist and didn't leave us something that was easy to read. But for whatever reason it is, it's the culture that is welcoming this book and Wilson and I'm so glad to have been their beneficiary. Get the hook! <laughs> I'm going over behind the stage. I'm having my glass of whiskey. Monica Higgins warned me that we will uh, all turn into pumpkins at 7.15. No! <laughs> and so I would encourage those of you who would love to spend more time uh, with Dr. Dabney, as I would certainly love to, to please join him uh, in the outer lobby. Sir, uh, a rousing thanks from all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and I'm supposed to accompany you by a specific reason. Okay. But first of all, thank you very much. It's brilliant. Well, and I think.